Welcome to Elevate Care, the show where healthcare professionals, visionaries, and thought leaders come together to discuss the limitless possibilities of healthcare innovation. I am Carrie Perez, your host, and I am joined here with my esteemed colleague, Liz Cunningham, VP of Digital Solutions. Welcome, Liz. Thanks for joining. Thank you, Carrie. Thanks for having me. So excited to talk with you today. Before we get going, could you tell us a little bit about your background and your role at AMN and maybe a little bit about why healthcare matters to you? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I've been with AMN for, oh, my 11-year anniversary Mm. is coming up very soon. So 11 years um, and actually started in the marketing space at AMN, which is uh, why, you know, I think I'm uniquely positioned now to be in the technology space since we're really tying together experiences that, you know, marketing and clinician experience creates, tying it with digital solutions and technology. So that's why I'm really passionate about what I do now. Um, Evolved in my career over AMN of just creating things that bring delight to our clinicians and our clients. And whether it's through marketing or operations or technology, I've just been able to build on that for the last 10 years. So, you know, we grew up a little bit together in in the marketing department and um, you have always had such a a knack for really putting your uh, yourself in the position of a candidate. And for us, candidates are everything from our nurses to our doctors to our um, interpreters. And it is such an important part of our um, ecosystem right now because we know, of course, there's a clinician shortage. We don't have to really talk about that. But tell me a little bit about sort of the evolution of candidate acquisition and mm-hmm. how important it is to have that candidate experience be the center part. Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting. And I think um, what happened during the pandemic you know, added a lot more of options. So I feel like nurses had this amazing... Um, opportunity of choice over the last five years. And, you know, with choice, then forces companies like us, staffing companies and um, healthcare systems to really step it up when it comes to the engagement and the experience that they're creating to attract and retain those talent. Mm -hmm. So I feel like that's been something that's really been an interesting evolution and put a lot of power um, back into the hands of our clinicians because they are in high demand yeah, um, and they do have a choice. So when it comes to AMN and what we build and the experience we try to create, one, I think we have to be aware of the choice and two, we have to create experiences that meet the clinician where they're at in their career. Um, you know, I think when you think about the spectrum of new grads to travel nurses to per diem clinicians to permanent nurses to nurse managers and i'm just using nurse as an example Mm -hmm. for now we can't just kind of shove that down you know a clinician's throat at all points in time we really have to be thoughtful about what is the right time to pull that person into that career when makes the most sense for them what are those buying signals um and that's really what we've been focused on here of just meeting them where they're at, mm-hmm. whether it's technology or recruiters or helping the health systems identify that for their clinicians. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And something that you alluded to I want to touch on a little bit more is the concept of choice and also the concept of self-service. So I know you've been really um, spearheading a lot of our our efforts with our clinician-facing app, um, Passport. Mm-hmm. Con- congratulations. I think it's still at, you know, 4.7 stars in our... H- hanging in there, hanging, yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, but that's really been such a, a, a leading technology for our clinicians to kind of have their choice in their hands. Maybe can you talk a, a little bit about some of the capabilities of Passport and how during this pandemic you've even evolved that to meet the needs of our clients, mm-hmm. maybe such as, you know, float pool or things like that. Yeah. So, um, you know, the journey of AIM and Passport has been evolution over the last of the last few years. And, you know, I think if you if you think about it as just a standalone app, maybe by itself, it's not that revolutionary. But if you think about it as an app that's embedded into the daily life of our clinicians and our healthcare professionals and can be used at various points in your career, then it becomes something useful that you're not offloading, you know, whenever your 30 days of not uploading new apps expires on your phone, right? Mm -hmm. All of us have that when you go and you're like, oh, I haven't used that app for a year (laughs) and I have to re-download it. Mm -hmm. So our goal is that that remains, AMA Passport remains relevant to the clinician throughout their life cycle. So like I said, it's evolved. I mean, it first started as a job app, right? How do we get the right jobs to the clinicians at the right time? Then it started to evolve into a community app. So how do we actually allow for 
clinicians to engage with other clinicians and stay engaged in our app when it comes to, you know, beyond just finding that job. And then we started to say, okay, well, what resources do clinicians need when they're starting to look for jobs? And how do we create more blogs and articles that help educate them on when should you think about travel nursing? When is per diem right for you? When is it time to go perm? How do you find the right hospital that meets your needs? You know, how do you know as a first time traveler where, what's a travel friendly hospital to go to? So we really started to just evolve and add more useful tools beyond a transaction that have then turned our app into being you know, quite a sticky app, right? Stickiness and engagement is how we measure success. And, you know, we've gone from an app where in the beginning someone logged in a couple times, their first download, found a job and never used it again to now an app that people are using once, if not twice a week. And we're continuously adding more and more engaged users onto that app. Mm -hmm. And I know you're always kind of measuring and getting feedback from clinicians throughout their experience. How have you taken some of that feedback and built it back into the app to really be focusing on that experience mm -hmm, for mm -hmm. a clinician. Yeah, it, you know, we, we say our app is uh, built for clinicians by clinicians. Uh, we have consistent voice of the customer panels that our team runs monthly and ad hoc as we're bringing in new features. And, and what we do is we don't just build something and then say, you know, hey, uh, physical therapist, like, what do you think of this new thing we built? It's actually at the design phase where we're saying, hey, we heard a problem that you're trying to solve is that you're unable to tell if, you know, this new hospital you're going to is traveler friendly. Um, so here are a couple ideas that we had. You know, what do you think? And we'll actually iterate and design with them in these sessions. And then by the time we're launching the app capability, it's something that we already know is wanted versus us building something that is then maybe accepted. Mm -hmm. You know, another cool thing, I think, you know, watching the evolution of uh, your time at AMN is also getting more in front of our clients, um, especially now that technology is just so ever present in every conversation. Right. AMN, tech centric total talent solutions company, you spent some time with our clients and, and talking to them. Can you give us a little insight about what they're asking for? As I mentioned, this supply driven market over the last five years, we are now seeing, you know, a pendulum swing to focusing on the clients and actually their digital capabilities. I, I think sometimes, you know, it's easy to talk about all the great things we're doing for our candidates and we will we'll continue to always do those for our candidates. But we do have a two sided marketplace, right? We've got all the capabilities and the B2C that we have to do for our, our um, clinicians and then on the B2B side for our clients. So a couple of things for clients that I think is interesting and I think it's interesting in the entire tech space is there have been a lot of ad hoc products that have come into the workforce technology space over the last couple of years. And a lot of us have purchased those. AMN's purchased them, right? Um, clients have purchased them where, you know, a couple years ago, you had a separate product for scheduling and you had a separate VMS and you had a separate ATS and you had a separate HRS and EMR and going and keep going and going and going, right? We're seeing so much consolidation in that space where you're seeing, you know, platform plays, you're seeing your ATS combined with your HRS, you're seeing your scheduling so solution combined with your time and attendance solution. And I think hospitals are trying to figure out in their IT strategy how they're going to combine all of this, but then also how they're going to have a workforce technology and a workforce staffing partner that can grow into that mm -hmm. space with them. So I think we're all figuring it out together. And they've been a lot of consultative conversations around, okay, if I'm thinking about, you know, buying this new scheduling technology or, or using AMN scheduling technology for Smart Square, for example, well, you know, can I use that with a VMS? Do I need a VMS? How does that work when I have holes in my schedule still? Um, you know, do I want to use a marketplace solution? And and I, and it's been they've been really. Um, two-way conversations between us and the clients. Solve um, issues and problems and all have its place. But just like everybody else, you know, a hospital client doesn't want 15 places to mm -hmm. log into and mm -hmm. and have a, a disconnected experience. So uh, I, I feel like your point on moving more towards this platform play and getting into this ecosystem is, is super valid. So thanks for sharing that perspective. Yeah. And if you don't mind me just adding one more thought to it, it's it's also about aggregating the data, right? So even if 
maybe the platforms are separate. Maybe you do still have a different scheduling solution than your HRS system. Like that's okay. But how do you unlock the value of data? I was just reading an interesting article um, about a health system in Nebraska, and they were saying that leveraging behavioral data for their clinicians plus some AI capabilities like increased their uh, retention rate or sorry, yes, increased their retention rate um, times two, double their retention mm-hmm. rate. Um, and I was I read the headline of the article and I'm like, all right, um, how does AI help with retention? <laughs> um, so I, I dove into it and I thought it was really interesting because really it was a data play. It was like, what are the signals out there that indicate burnout? How do I know that a clinician worked, you know, doubles back to back because her colleague was a no-show two days in a row. How do I know that the volume, the patient volume for that unit was way above what the norm should be for the last three weeks in a row? And how do I take that data to then say, hey, you know, alert, this clinician might be getting burnt out. And then with those signals, how do I then layer on the human element Mm -hmm. of, hey, do you need some time off? Let me go have, you know, a more senior nurse back you so you have an easier shift, things like that. So I also think across all those systems, there's these nuggets that you can kind of bring together from a data solution to then, you know, make some some action against yeah. against what's happening. Yeah. You know, you, you just mentioned AI and it feels like you can't um, go anywhere without stumbling upon somebody talking about mm-hmm. AI. And it's, it's such a buzzy word. Uh, everyone has a perspective on it. And I'm just curious, what does it actually mean now? Mm -hmm. You know, I feel like it's something that everybody says that they need. And maybe there's often times people gobbling up assets that have AI in it. But why why is it actually relevant now? Yeah, so I am uh, no AI expert. So I will I will say that right now. But you know, I think AI is buzzy right now because of generative AI. Think about the chat GPTs of the world. And that's all about generating novel content. So something new, right? Something that's not just taking existing data and predicting what's going to happen. It's about generating something new. Um, And I still think that space is experimental when it comes to healthcare and healthcare staffing. I will say I think LinkedIn did something pretty creative with generative AI recently. And they have, um, which will be something we could apply in the staffing space, but they have a... uh, Oh, I forgot what it's called, but it's like some sort of LinkedIn assist. So basically, when you go to look at a job, it'll pop up and say, hey, do you want to see how your profile would rank against this job? And basically what it's doing is it's taking the large language model and saying, "Okay, based on all these different types of candidates that get these different types of jobs, here's like 10 things you're missing from your profile. And it's actually recommending to you what to add to your profile so that the person actually looks at your Mm. resume like and it's that's not just interesting looking at use a case. field that's open and a field that you need to fill out, which to me doesn't seem like AI. Correct. This is probably, yeah, looking at like what the potential is for a human to care about what you're what you're put on paper. Correct. Correct. And you know, th- I think in the in the staffing space too, we've used AI for um, image recognition for a while. The credentialing space, you know, everyone knows that's a painful process. And we're trying to continuously take handwritten documents and turn them into structured data. That's a form of AI, Mm -hmm. right? Um, Even some semantic searching capabilities, natural language processing, they're all different forms of AI. But the buzz right now is around generative. Mm -hmm. And how do we use it? Um, And, you know, I, I do think there will be use cases in the healthcare space, especially for us on the staffing side. Um, but there always will probably be caution when it comes to actually, you know, patient engagement and, yeah. and that side of the house. Okay, great. Thanks. Thanks for that deep dive. I do want to circle back um, to to one element I didn't ask when we were talking about, you know, tech platform. Um, and actually, recently you and I attended an event about um, IT and mm-hmm. and staffing. And you you asked a really good question to the panel that maybe I want to see if I'm going to ask it back to you if you Ooh, okay. if you might have an answer. So you were you were referencing all the sort of proliferation of all this technology and all these different point solutions, and you asked a great question of, well, what should be removed now that we have this different sort of ecosystem with things coming together? If you were asked that question, what would you answer? Yeah. So, you know, technology is expensive, right? This is not, this is not free. And especially if you're not, you know, building something yourself and you're deciding to buy and partner with various, you know, SaaS solutions, you're 
paying licensing fees that, you know, can add up to a couple thousand dollars a month per person, you know, using all these different solutions. So we could just talk about a recruiter, for example. Think about the desk of a recruiter right now. They could have a chat bot through one, you know, company. They could have an automated referencing solution through another. They could have a, you know, conversational SMS through another solution. They could have an ATS. They could have a CRM. They can have so many different capabilities, but you're spending on every single one of them. So I don't know if I think any of them are going to go away, but I am seeing companies out there unlocking kind of a secret sauce to combining them all into one platform. Mm -hmm. So do I think multimodal communication and the need to be able to transition from chat to SMS to email to doing your ATS um, you know, matching and ranking, doing your relationship management, your CRM is going to go away. No. Do I think bringing them all together into one solution will continue to be out there? Yes. And mm -hmm. I think it will be really interesting to see who survives in that space because there are a lot of companies that I think are close, but a lot of them are doing the same thing mm -hmm. and using the AI buzzword to right. try to get you to buy their product. Exactly. So um, I, I think it's going to be consolidation um, versus necessarily like removal of some of those capabilities. Awesome. Maybe the auto dialer will go away. How about that? <laughs> the auto dialer is going to go away. There's no chance that that lives in a space where you have so many other ways to communicate. You have so many regulations with TCPA. Like the auto dialer. That's my, that's my, put that on there. That makes a lot of sense. We don't need just a random dialing. <laughs> now we'll have curated lists of people exactly. who are waiting for our call based off of what we're predicting. It, based on, you know, a website that you just looked on or something that you just looked on on social media. It'll be targeted and specific, yes. not random. And wanted. Hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, this this next question is just a little bit off, off script, but, you know, you have a unique perspective coming from marketing, um, you know, talking with clients, technology, even your background, you know, outside of AMN. Um, what are some things that, you know, you're thinking about that maybe other people aren't that you think we should be? So I'll, I'll stick with the theme of consolidation. And I don't think that maybe no one's thinking about this, but I think a problem that a lot of our clients and our clinicians are experiencing is that there are a lot of apps and capabilities in the healthcare workforce technology space right now that seem cool and are pretty flashy. Um, I think there's going to be a lot of consolidation happening in the per diem and marketplace space. I think there are a lot of apps out there that are selling a marketplace to clients that seem to solve a problem to fill holes in their you know schedules. But I think everyone's missing the clinician experience behind that. Mm. Um, I think that you can't expect a clinician in one metro area that's floating across five facilities to have five different applications in her pocket to pick up a shift. Right. And I think what we really need to be thinking about is remembering, remembering about the two-sided marketplace. And like I talked about on the client aggregation, it's there. But the clinicians are more likely the ones using apps and self-service from a day-to-day -day perspective, and they're not going to put up with using five different things. So I, I think we'll see consolidation in that space, and I think we're going to have to figure out what does that look like? What does it mean? How do we still do it in a way where the clinician has choice, but that we've created a better self-service experience for them to pick up you know, shifts and jobs where they want to? I love that. I mean, it brings it full circle to these are people. Right. right. <laughs> and they have experiences. And it is not a transactional experience of just um, getting someone to fill a job. These right. are people with choice and who are experiencing things not just within the healthcare um, sector. They are having a good experience with an app, you know, on Uber or with ordering from, you know, uh, their, their local restaurant. They're going to take that same perspective of what they expect into this setting as well. Right. Yeah. Right. Awesome. Okay, last question for, for you, Liz. Um, there's a lot of trouble and, and pressure in healthcare. We know them all. We don't have to go through the, the basics, but, you know, of course, cost and mm -hmm. the shortage. But we're in the space and, and we care about it and we're passionate about it. And, and we've been here for a long time. Why are you hopeful and optimistic about healthcare? Healthcare has always been known as being very behind 
mm-hmm. in a tech space. And I think over the last year, two years, there are a lot of eyes and regulation and questions to these tech giants that haven't been questioned, you know, since their inception. So maybe I'm hopeful that it's not a bad thing that healthcare is a little behind because from a technology perspective, we'll learn from these mature tech giants and, you know, figure out the rules of the road when it comes to data privacy, figure out the rules of the road when it comes to content moderation and generative generative AI. And maybe it'll be the perfect time for healthcare to really accelerate forward to being more tech first because we have smart people thinking about it, the investments are out there, and we've learned from the mistakes of non-healthcare technology solutions. Love that. Liz, thank you so much. Really enjoyed our conversation today. Thank you for keeping the clinician and the client experience center in everything that you do. And everyone, thanks for joining today. Hope you enjoyed listening to us. Please feel free to find out more information on amnhealthcare.com and follow us on social media at amnhealthcare and listen to us on your favorite podcast platform. 